before we get started today, normally uh, Dave would be coming up and doing these, but we're in different times today. Just an update on the, the whole coronavirus thing. We are trying to live stream as much as possible, uh, trying to honor the governing authorities saying uh, how many people could be in a, a facility at one point in time. We're trying to love our neighbors. We're also never going to be compromising on our biblical mandate as a church given us by our Lord Jesus. So we're going to continue to update people through the, the website, through Facebook, through our email newsletter. And if you're not subscribed to that, you can find links to all those things at calvarytyler.com. And I would suggest that if you've not done so in the past, get subscribed and get subscribed to all of these things. Uh, uh, on Facebook, you, you can link to that. And our YouTube as well, by the way, we will be streaming live uh, through Facebook Live right now because we can do that. YouTube only allows live streaming when you're up to 1,000 subscribers or more. And uh, as of yesterday, we were at 455. So we've got a ways to go. But if you subscribe and if you share, you ask people to subscribe, that might help us get up to 1,000. We can start uh, uh, doing it live on YouTube instead. I do want to ask that you continue praying for our servants and our leaders as we try to work through these various things. Uh, it was a blessing to see uh, the children's ministry um, go online today, and so uh, hopefully that will continue in the future. Be praying for them as they continue to, to do that. And I would also ask that, you know, because we're in this weird time, just use this time to reach out to your friends and neighbors with the love of Christ. You know, with the stress of quarantine and, and all these other things, you know, people are, are looking for hope, and we've got the hope of Jesus and we can offer that to them. So uh, use that time. One other thing, quickly, uh, this Wednesday, we would normally have our Wednesday night service, but as many of you know, we've had a, a death in our family with Marilyn's uh, father passing away, so we'll be headed to El Paso this week uh, for the funeral there. And uh, so we won't have any service either in-house or online on, on this coming Wednesday. Uh, but appreciate your praying for us as we go. But we'll continue as we have been doing on Sunday when we get back into to Romans. But that said, we are in Romans chapter 9 today. Romans chapter 9. And uh, wherever you are, if you're here or if you're at home, take your Bible, stand up out of respect to the Word of God. And uh, we'll look at Romans chapter 9. It went on the wrong one. It's not on Calvary Chapel. It's on my personal one. Hold on. Sorry. Ah, the fun things about live video. I'm going to go ahead and start. Romans chapter 9, verse 1 says this I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son." And not only this, but when Rebekah had also conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having any done any evil. Let's try that again. Verse 11. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Father, we need your grace today. And we need your power as we would get into your word, that uh, technology would not be distractions. Lord, it's your word that has power. It is your gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us grace to preach and proclaim that gospel. So that all who would hear, if any would hear at all, would know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Fill us with your spirit 
and teach us your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The yeah buts can get us into trouble. And you know the net yeah buts. It's when you're told something and your first response is, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but in my case, things are different. Yeah, but what you don't understand is X, Y, Z, or I think that the worst version is, yeah, but what the Bible says here doesn't really apply to me. The yeah, buts can get into a lot of trouble, and they can be dangerous. At other times, they can raise legitimate questions. One of these things might have been asked of Paul, who, you know, had just written all this in Romans uh, to this point. All of it has been about the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is so good, it's so thorough, and it saves everyone who believes in Jesus by faith. And in response to all of that, as Paul went through that, somebody might have asked, yeah, but what about the Jews? Although the original church was, as we know, nearly 100% Jewish, the percentage of that changed greatly over time. At the time of Paul's writings, Uh, Gentiles readily outnumbered Jews in the worldwide church, and of course we know that that disparity has grown exponentially over the centuries. So yes, the gospel promise is wonderful, but what about the people to whom it was originally promised? What about the Jews and their relationship with Jesus? Now, the thing that Paul is going to show about this promise of the gospel is that this is a promise of a gift Yes, salvation is available, but salvation is a gift, one that must be extended to us by the giver. Gifts are not demanded. Gifts cannot be deserved. Gifts, by definition, are given out of kindness and grace, and that's exactly what God does with Jesus, and we'll see this in our passage today. You know, and even as Gentile Christians, this is important for us to uh, remember. None of us deserves God's salvation, nor could any of us earn his salvation through our efforts or through an act of our will. We must be saved by God's grace according to God's word, and that only happens through simple faith in God's Son. And that is the gospel that's available to the entire world, and that's the glorious gift of God. Now, understand, contextually, we're at a little bit of a break in, in the book. Right, we've come to a transition point in the book of Romans. Paul is making a major topic shift, and so it almost seems like we're slamming on the brakes in, w- in one sense. Of course, the overall theme of the letter, the overall topic, has been the gospel. We referenced it earlier, Romans 1.16. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And you might put it another way, that the good news of Jesus is good news for all. It's good news for everybody. Both Jew and Greek can be saved through the Jewish Messiah if they but put their faith and trust in Jesus as the crucified and resurrected Son of God. Now, how all of this takes place, that's the subject of the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. And Paul went into great detail about the doctrine of salvation, and just by way of review, because that did wrap up, first he showed that all people desperately need to be saved, including both Jew and Gentile people. None is immune from sins, none immune from sin's effects, and all people need to be rescued by God. Second, he taught that no one can save him or herself. Again, emphasizing the inabilities of Jews and Gentiles. No good works, no good genealogies. We'll look at that a little bit more today. But no genealogies can save us and make us right in the sight of God. We need the rescue that God offers through Jesus. Third, he showed that God justifies us by faith in Jesus according to his promises. That's what God always said that he would do, and this is what he does. In justification, we are made right in the sight of God, forgiven of our many sins of the past. Additionally, fourth, God sanctifies us by his precious gift of the Holy Spirit, who is promised to be given to all who believe in Jesus. God the Holy Spirit empowers us to fight our daily battles against sin, putting our deeds of the flesh to death. In sanctification, we're freed from our many sins of the present, the power of sin over us being broken. Fifth, God the Holy Spirit is also our guarantee of our future glorification. We will be resurrected in the future, just like Jesus has been resurrected in the past, and we're promised to live forever in the presence of God. Now, in glorification, we know we're freed from the presence of sin. We're both spiritually and physically transformed by the grace and the power of God. And then we wrapped up with the sixth idea uh, last time. All this work is God's work done according to God's plan, guaranteed to be completed by God. He's going to see it all the way through from beginning to end. Now, when it comes to a doctrine on anything, that's about as complete as we can get. Paul's teaching on the gospel has been thorough, 
So we might ask, what more can be added? Well, in those first eight chapters, Paul described the what of the gospel. In the next three chapters, he gets to some of the who. Now, the how picks up in chapter 12 and goes to the end of the book. But for now, who is it that experiences these gospel blessings? Earlier, we saw that Paul wrote that the good news is the power to salvation to both Jew and Greek. But you know, when you look at the Old Testament, the gospel promise speaks of the Hebrew Messiah through the Hebrew Scriptures. If that's the case, why is it that so few Hebrews seem to believe? Beyond that, how can the promises of the Hebrew Messiah apply to the Gentile heathens? You know, you got this situation even right here in the book of Romans, where you got this former Pharisee by the name of Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, Pharisee writing to this group of Christians, Jew and Gentile, in Rome, and it highlights how unusual this whole situation is. Why is the Jewish gospel about the Jewish Messiah being given to the Gentiles, or why weren't more Jewish people believing in their Messiah? Well, this is Paul's subject through the next several chapters, and he starts with this idea here of a special promise. God had promised his salvation through the Messiah was given to the Jews. It wasn't that this promise fell short to the Jews. It's that his promise was based on the gift of grace. Grace is never something earned. It's not deserved. It's always a gift. If grace is earned, then it's not grace at all. Grace is God's precious gift available to all and something we want to ensure that we receive. So in verses 1 through 5, we look at this promise, but it's an unused promise. It's an unused promise, even though salvation is available. Verses 1 through 4 say this, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I wish that I myself was cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Stop there. You know, for all of the joy with which Paul ended chapter 8, it's striking that he starts chapter 9 with such utter and sincere sorrow. Just look up to the, the previous verses or across the page, wherever it is. Romans 8, 37 through 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, after all of that, one might think Paul would break into song, doxology. By the way, that's exactly what we'll get at the end of chapter 11. For all that God has done for us in Christ, for all that he's promised in, in Jesus, for all that he guarantees us through the Holy Spirit, this is something that's worth our praise. We should sing, we should shout, we should jump for joy that God makes us hyper-conquerors in Jesus, forever joined to him through his immeasurable love for us. Yet, Paul doesn't jump for joy. He doesn't break into song. Instead, he has what? Great sorrow. He has continual grief. Or we might even say he has mega sorrow, literally from the Greek. Mega sorrow, uneasing, unceasing pain. This is real heartfelt pain for Paul without exaggeration. He's even showing, he's taking an oath on the name of Christ and having the joint testimony of the Holy Spirit. Said the Holy Spirit knows what I'm talking about here. This day of joy, what should have been a day of joy, was a day of pain for the apostle, and it was one that grieved him deeply. Why was it? Well, because Paul longed for Israel. He mourned over their rejection of Christ. He would rather sacrifice himself for their sake. If it were possible, he would rather that he would be damned rather than his countrymen to be the ones that were accursed from Christ. Paul may have been the one that were the apostle to the Gentiles, but he desperately longed for Jews to be saved. You know, throughout his missionary journeys, whenever Paul entered a new town, he and his team would first go into the synagogues to first preach the gospel to the Jews before he ever took the gospel to the Gentiles. Unlike so many today, Paul was not merely a Jew by birth and by culture. He was a Jew through and through. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a tribe of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He was the son of a Pharisee. And you can read about those things in Philippians chapter 3 and Acts chapter 23. Paul had a background and just an internal nature of being a Hebrew. He had a love for his people, and he considered them as much family as fellow compatriots, and he wanted them to be saved. And when they were not, he mourned, he grieved. He wished he could substitute himself. Those who have unsafe family members know the feeling. 
Although there are a lot of Christians out there who have been blessed, been raised in God-fearing homes with parents that love the Lord Jesus, and you ought to praise God if you've got that upbringing, uh, many others of us do not have that. Some of us not only have unsafe family members, but we might be the only Bible-believing uh, Christian in our entire family line. So while we rejoice in the promises of God's salvation, we do grieve for those who are not yet saved. There are even times we might long for ourselves to be lost if it meant that our loved ones would come to know Jesus in truth. Well, what do we do in those times? Well, obviously, you can't substitute yourself or your family. No more than Moses could substitute himself on behalf of the nation of Israel when they sinned against the Lord at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses pleaded with God, you know, blot my name out of the book if it meant that Israel might be saved. And God flat out refused Moses' offer to do so. And he said, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Exodus 32, verse 33. You can't offer yourself as a substitute. But God has offered a substitute. Our substitute is Jesus. He's a substitute for the world. We cannot give ourselves for our family. Jesus has already done so. So we go to Christ. We appeal to him in prayer. We never stop interceding for those who are lost. We never stop sharing the gospel with those who do not yet know him. Who can say whether the person who denies Jesus today will deny him tomorrow? We don't know what the future holds, so we take advantage of every opportunity we have to share Christ with those who need him most. That was Paul's desire for Israel. By the way, notice that Israel was Paul's countrymen. He says it very specifically here, according to the flesh, because he was born of that line. But who were his countrymen according to the Spirit? Well, Christians, right? Jew and Gentile. Paul's family, by the blood of his fathers, were the Jews who, by and large, rejected Jesus. Paul's family, by the blood of Christ, were the Jews and Gentiles around the world who believed. Beloved, we have family all around the world. Anyone who has saving faith in Jesus as the Son of God is our brother or sister in Christ. Those who are in Christ are never alone. We have a cloud of witnesses that surrounds us. And this is really good news, especially in the days of quarantines, right? And social distancing. You may be stuck in your room, in your house, but you're not alone. We need not be distant in our social distancing. We have brothers and sisters who love us and need to be reminded of our love for them. So let me encourage you to reach out to them, pray for them, pray with them, continue to build one another up in the Lord. We need to be joined to each other as countrymen and family. So we need to act like we are, especially in these days. As for the countrymen for whom Paul longed, it wasn't that the Jews lacked the opportunity to be saved. No, they had plenty of opportunity. Pick up again in verse 4. To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, and the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. See, Israel had been given everything. They've been given every advantage when it came to the gospel. And you might recall, this has been a major topic of discussion back in Romans chapter 2 and 3. And in fact, Romans 3 verses 1 and 2 said this, What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is of circumcision, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. And what he's saying here is that of every nation on the earth, the Hebrew people have been given the prophetic and the written word of God. They were stewards of the wisdom, of the knowledge, and of the promises of God. And all the world could know the mind of God if they just came to Israel and they searched the scriptures that Israel had. This was the advantage of Israel. You know, for all of our questions today about those who haven't heard the gospel, and you hear this all the time, well, what about that tribe in Africa that doesn't have anything? What about that tribe in the jungles of South America that doesn't have missionaries, that doesn't have Bibles? For all those excuses we like to throw out, that was an excuse Israel had. They had the oracles of God, and they always had the oracles of God. As Israel was chosen by God to be his people, what? From the pages of Genesis onward. Well, what did they have? Well, Paul lists at first six terms, six items. First is the adoption the adoption. The Jews were made the people of God, his own special children. God declared, you might recall, he said it of Jesus as well, but out of Egypt I called my son. Hosea 11 verse 1. Not only speaking of uh, Jesus and his exodus out of Egypt after uh, the, the massacre of Herod had been completed, but also originally speaking of the, the nation of Israel as God purchased them out of slavery through the event of the Passover. Before we as Gentiles were made the children of God through Jesus, before we were given the spirit of adoption, Romans 8, verse 15, the Jews were already God's adopted children. They were given the adoption. Second, they were given the glory. 
When speaking of the glory, Paul is most likely referring to the visible glory of God. This is what Israel saw on the top of Mount Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments. This is what led Israel through the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. This is what rested over the tabernacle. This is what filled the temple. The glory of God descended into it. Israel saw the weighty cloud. They saw the fire from heaven. They saw the glory of God. And you would think that that didn't cause them to believe not much would. That would make an impact. They had the glory. Third, they had the covenants. The covenants. They had the relationships they had with God through Abraham and through Moses and through David. They had the word of God promising them a land and inheritance and Messiah. They had a special relationship with God, having God as their own king and them being his people. They had the signs of circumcision and the Sabbath day guaranteeing their relationship with God. That was something that no other nation had. They were unique in that fashion. They were also had the, the giving of the law. They had the written statutes, the ordinances, the overall word of God. Whereas other nations had the laws and traditions of men, Israel had the law of Almighty God. They had what was perfect. And so they could understand God's own perfect character and standard. And in looking at the law, they would understand their own imperfection and their need for a Savior. Next it says that they had the service of God. That's talking about worship. Worship. Of all the nations of the world, Israel had been given the opportunity to worship. They had the sacrifices, the temple, they had the method to worship God according to his will. The, the Jews did not have to, have to guess at how to worship God in spirit and truth. They had God's written directives on the matter as well as his blessing in doing it. And they just needed to engage in it more often. And then lastly, the sixth thing Paul writes here is that they had the promises. Israel had been recipients of abundant prophecy, speaking not only of their immediate future, but also of the Messiah and the future kingdom. They had the guaranteed word of God on multitudes of topics, knowing that God would fulfill every single word he spoke. Six things, immense blessings, advantages that Israel had over the, the rest of the world. In all that list, Paul follows it up with one more item that was important than all the six that came before it. On top of everything else, Israel was given the family family lineage, the line, the genealogy of the Messiah. They have both the ancestry of and the fulfillment of Christ himself. The Lord Jesus Christ is the son of David, the son of Abraham, and the son of Adam. If Israel had been given nothing else, this alone would have set them apart as being blessed above over every other nation of the world. Their family tree led to the Son of God. And that's amazing. And of course, this is what they missed. The very best they've been given, the very best they've been offered is the thing they rejected. And Jesus came into his own, and his own did not receive him, John writes, John 1, 11. And if they missed Jesus, they missed everything. It didn't matter what else they received from God if they did not receive his son. So too with us. It doesn't matter what we receive in terms of blessing if we don't receive the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus. It doesn't matter what wealth we earn or what we inherit it doesn't matter what family tree we have. It doesn't matter what advantages or what disadvantages we have in life. All that's meaningless without Jesus. What good is a PhD if you're doomed for death? It's a piece of paper on the wall and does it help a person in hell? What good is wealth if you can't take it into eternity? So in all your blessings, don't miss the most important blessing of all, and that's salvation through faith in Christ. Now before we leave this verse, don't miss the Christology, the really fun theology here about Jesus. Look again at your text. It says that Jesus is the eternally blessed God. He's the ultimate authority who is over all. Jesus is the Son of God, but he is not less than God. Jesus is not the Father, but neither is he less God than God the Father or God the Spirit. Jesus is fully God. He's the second person of the Godhead, fully, truly God. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords, having all authority over heaven and earth. It is to Jesus that all praise and glory is due. It's to him whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. When we worship Jesus, we worship the living God. Amazing opportunities were held by the Jews. Amazing advantages. God gave them every opportunity to recognize Christ, put their faith in Christ, and offer the salvation, uh, receive the salvation that was offered by Jesus. And sadly, they refused all these things. For the most part, the, the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah, and the message of his gospel was then taken to the Gentiles. That Israel, by and large, is not saved is not due to a lack of opportunity. God's salvation is available to all. It was an unused availability. 
an unused promise. We too have been given multitudes of opportunities by God regarding the gospel. Just think of the time in which we live. We not only reside in a nation as on a history of Christian evangelism, but we live during a time in which the gospel goes out in amazing ways. We have the printed word. We've had that for 600 years near about. Gutenberg Printing Press was invented in 1440. Revolutionized the availability of the Bible and other Christian tracts. But in 2020, you don't have to wait for a press for a book to get published. You can press a button and have it published on a worldwide platform instantly. You can preach a live stream Bible message to a global audience. You can press a button and get the gospel of Jesus into a country that's otherwise closed to Christianity. We've been given incredible opportunities by the Lord. We need to use them and not waste them. And likewise, we've been given incredible opportunities to respond to the gospel of Christ. Any single person hearing this message today has been given the chance to respond to the Messiah given by God, just like Israel had the chance to respond to their Messiah. We don't want to waste our opportunity like Israel wasted theirs. It's a glorious gift in these opportunities to recognize and respond to Jesus. But we need to remember that not only were these opportunities gifts in themselves, the salvation to which those opportunities pointed, that salvation is also a gift. Because as glorious as those opportunities were, those opportunities for the gospel did not save them. The gospel itself does. The salvation itself is the gift of God. So it was an unused promise, but it's also a gracious promise we see in verses 6 through 13. Salvation is not only available, salvation is a gift. Look at verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Stop here. Why, why does Paul bring this up at this point? It's because it might be easy to accuse God's word of falling short. After all, if Israel had been given so many opportunities for the gospel, and they had the promises of God about the Messiah, yet all those promises seemed unused and unrealized, what did that say about God's word? Was it somehow insufficient? Was it ineffective? Well, absolutely not. God's promise is true. It's never wasted. What God spoke and what he had written was not in error. The problem was not with God's word, because God's word is inerrant. The problem is with the stubborn rebellion of the people to whom it was given. That rebellion was itself prophesied in the Bible, so you know the Bible is inerrant. By the way, by itself, this is a truth important to affirm beyond even this initial context of Romans chapter 9. Now, this immediate context speaks specifically of the word of God that was entrusted to the Jewish people that spoke of their Messiah how this word will not, does not fall short. And Paul has a lot to say about that issue throughout Romans 9, 10, and 11. We'll see that all the way through. But this truth is true in all contexts. Paul says it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, or as other translations might put it, it is not as though the word of God has failed. It hasn't weakened. It hasn't blown off course like a wayward ship at sea. God's word is true, it's accurate, it's effectual. It always accomplishes the purposes for which God intended it. As Paul, excuse me, as God said to Isaiah, God's word never returns void. Isaiah 55, 11. What God says, God does, and this is always the case. And again, this is crucial for us to remember during the season of coronavirus and quarantines and fear. We need to remember God's word never returns void. It's always true. It always accomplishes its purposes. We think back to the, one of the promises just from the previous chapter that we looked at uh, last week, the week before, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And people say, well, how exactly is God going to use COVID-19 for his good and for his purpose? Well, who can say? You know, perhaps with all this quarantine, more people are going to be using social media than ever before. More people are going to catch streaming worship services and Bible studies. Perhaps the fear that it brings is going to cause more people to fall to their knees and seek the Lord. Perhaps among the church, it causes us to get inventive and we actively seek out ways that we can minister to one another. There are all kinds of ways that God can use this tragedy for his good. We just need to trust him to do it. Not only are God's promises true, God's promises are true for the true Israel. This is what Paul is getting to when he writes this. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. You know, just because somebody's born of the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, it does not mean that the person has faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promises made to Israel regarding their salvation 
through their Messiah were promises made to faithful Israel. See, this is why Jews like Paul and Peter and James and John and Barnabas, they were saved, and why so many other Jews were not. Jews who have faith in the Jewish Messiah show themselves to be faithful Israel. They show themselves to be of Israel. And those who don't have faith in him are not. Now, please don't get the wrong idea. It would be very easy to read Paul's statement here about Israel and conclude that the New Testament church has replaced Israel. In fact, there are many Christian denominations and, and theologians that teach this very thing. They claim that you know, all the many references to the kingdom in the pages of the Old Testament, they're really just references to the New Testament kingdom of God in the current church age. They claim the New Testament church is the new Israel of God and that those who are of Hebrew ancestry no longer have any claim to any promise in the Bible other than the promise of destruction. Now, we need to be very, very clear on this point. Paul does not teach replacement theology. Paul does not teach replacement theology. What Paul writes in Romans 9, well, we can't just take it by itself. We've got to take it in context. Where does the context come? Context comes in Romans 11. Romans 9 goes with Romans 11. And what does Romans 11 say? Well, I'll bring up a couple of verses for you. Romans 11, 2, or 1 and 2. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. God hasn't cast them away, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. He didn't replace them with anybody. He didn't replace them with the church. And get down to Romans 11, verse 25 and 26. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. God hasn't cast them away. He has a plan for them. The full context of Paul's statement in Romans, not just chapter 9, but Romans 9 through 11, really, <laughs> the entire book of Romans, is that the Jews are... They're not going to be replaced by the church. God's plan is not their eternal destruction and rejection so that he can replace them by the church. Quite the contrary. God has an active plan for ancestral Israel, and there will come a day where the genealogical people who are descended from Abraham will come to faith in their Hebrew Messiah. For people to claim that the church has replaced Israel is for people to claim that God's promises are not true. So heaven forbid we would take that position. If God's promises be not true for Israel, then neither can they be trusted for the church. But they are true, and God's word can be trusted. Now, the basic point Paul is really making here is simple. It should be obvious on its face. Just because someone is biologically descended from Israel does not mean that that person has faith in the promise of God that was given to Israel. Someone might be born a Jew, but not have any true Jewish faith. And that's blatantly obvious among the Jewish people today. You know, go around uh, the Jews, not only do the vast majority of them reject Jesus as the Messiah, but you can also find a lot of so-called Jewish atheists. They claim the ancestry and they can trace the family line, but they have zero faith in God at all. Now, they may be of Jewish descent, but they are by no means claimants to the Jewish promise. By the way, lest we point the finger too much, same thing happens in the church all the time. There are many men and women who vehemently claim that they're Christian, but they have no true faith in Christ. They show up in church, and they know the right words, but they don't know Jesus. Some, you know, they just show up at Christmas, Easter, weddings, and funerals. Others, on the other hand, in the other stream, they come every week. But it's not attendance that makes somebody a Christian. It's faith. Without faith, it's just false converts. There are tares sown among the wheat, as Jesus taught in Matthew 13. Now, perhaps you need to do some soul-searching to, deter to determine whether that describes you. Are you a Christian in name only, or are you of Christ and in Christ? And that difference makes all the difference in the world. So God's promises are true. His word is true. But it's true for a particular set of chosen people within the national descendants of Israel. And Paul illustrates that through two examples as we start to get to the end of this passage. The first example is the particular son of Abraham, which is Isaac. Verses 7 through 9 says this, Now, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise, At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. 
Remember that Abraham had more than one son biologically. But you might say he had only one son covenantally. The particular covenant son of Abraham promised by God was Isaac. Paul references here two uh, scriptures from Genesis. Genesis 21, verse 12, and Genesis 18, verses 10 and 14. Both refer to the specific particular promise of Isaac as the promised son of Abraham. You might recall that Abraham was 75 years old when he was first called by God to leave Abraham to go to this land that God was going to show him, and it was being promised to a son even at that time. But it wasn't until he was 90 years old, or at least, uh, 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 well, 90 years old, 100 years old, that Isaac was finally born. At that time, God's promise had been doubted. God's promise had been manipulated so much to the point that Abraham's first son was born of Sarah's maidservant. Yet that son, Ishmael, was not the promised son. The promise was particular to the firstborn son of Abraham and Sarah, and that promise was fulfilled with the birth of Isaac. The bottom line is in verse 8. Verse 8 makes a point. It's not the children of flesh that are the children of God. It's the children of promise. Biological descent was important in the case of Isaac, Indeed, it's essential. had to be born of Abraham. But it's not the only qualification required. What was needed on top of biology was the promise of God. Ishmael, son of Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant, was a biological son. But the promise belonged to Isaac, son of Sarah. To her, God's promise was made. And you say, well, how does all this apply today? Well, one, it opens up the door for Gentiles to be saved because we are the children of God according to his promise. We may not be physically descended from Abraham, but we have our faith in the promised son who was descended. And that's Jesus. So it opens the door for us. But secondly, it shows us that faith matters more than flesh. Faith matters more than flesh. Faith is more important than external factors. A person might be a baptized church member in good standing, who tithes, who teaches Sunday school, who does many good works, but without faith, everything else is a vanity of the flesh. And again, it's the difference between being a Christian in name only or being in Christ and of Christ. Those who have faith in the promise of Jesus, in other words, in Jesus himself, those who have faith in him are Christian and those who don't aren't. So not every Israelite is of Israel. Not every Christian, we might say, is of Christ. The promise of God belongs to a particular people, belongs to the people of faith. And so the question that's posed to each one of us is, do you have particular faith in the particular promise of God regarding Jesus. If you're not, then you're not part of the particular people. But you can be when you believe. Okay, that's one example. Beyond that, the second example is of Jacob and Esau, the sons of Isaac. And that shows that the promise of God belongs to those whom God chooses. It's particular, and it's God's choice. Look at verses 10 and 11. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Stop there. Remember that Isaac and Rebekah had twin sons, right? Esau and Jacob. Although they had the same genealogy, the same upbringing, the same opportunities, not to mention the same birthday, they did not have the same relationship with God. Esau despised the birthright originally available to him. He sold it outright for a bowl of lentil stew. Now, I like lentils a lot, but I'm not going to sell a birthright for it. Jacob treasured that birthright, and he's willing to do anything to acquire it. Even though it's only going to come by the grace of God, he was willing to manipulate, lie, cheat, and steal, do whatever he could to get it. Even in this, the response of the two sons wasn't the most important part. The grace of God was. There is indeed a difference between Esau and Jacob, but before Paul goes on to explain those differences, first he looks here at the sovereign choice of God. Before the twins were ever born, God had already made his choice. The prophecy given to Rebekah about her sons was given to her while she was still pregnant. God's choice between the two had already been made. God chooses his people a promise. It has nothing to do with the worth of the individual. It has everything to do with the grace of God. God looked upon these boys and he chose one to receive the promise. And he chose the unexpected younger son at that. God's choice makes all the difference in the world. Okay, well, what was this prophecy that was given to Rebekah? Well, we see it in verse 12 and 13. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. 
God chose to upend the expected order. He chose to give grace to one, not to the other, in essence saying that the younger of the sons, the twin sons, would have the birthright authority. Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. God had a plan in mind for Jacob, which was far better than the plan he had in mind for Esau. Now, both men would father great, large nations, but it was Jacob that has the lineage that leads to Jesus. So no matter what could be said of Esau, Jacob naturally had the better promise of God. And that brings up a couple of questions for us. Number one, did God truly hate Esau? After all, that's what the Bible says. In fact, this is a quote from Malachi. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 say this, I have loved you, says the Lord, but yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now, contextually, the, the word of the Lord through Malachi was a, really a word of chastisement to Israel. Uh, they had taken the Lord for granted, neglected their worship, neglected all kinds of things, engaged in terrible practices, and although God had graciously brought them back into their land after Babylonian captivity, they restored their temple, people fell back into all these old habits. So God gives this final word to Malachi, through Malachi, and after that he goes silent for 400 years until the arrival of John the Baptist. But how does he begin this word of discipline? Well, he compares the Jews to the Edomites. Right? Edom is the nation through whom uh, was descended, of course, they came through Esau. If the people of Esau had been judged by God the way he was, and they were not the people of God, how much more would the people of Israel be judged by God? The Jews had even more reason to take seriously the worship of God. All right, that's the context of the original passage here. And what does this mean for Paul and the Romans? It well, emphasizes God's gracious choice. God did not have to choose Esau over, uh, he did not have to choose Israel over Esau. It wasn't like the people of Israel were any better than the Edomites. They were doing the same things. God just chose Israel out of his grace. So did God truly hate Esau? Well, not necessarily, not really in the way we generally think of the word. The word could be used in that manner, but uh, the word also could be used as a comparative. The love that God had for Israel was far greater than what he had for Esau. The love he had for Israel made the, the, the love that he had for the Edomite people appear to be his hate. Now, surely God loved the Edomites as he loved any of his created people, he loves all people of the world, even the unsaved, reprobate people. But he does not love them in the same way that he loves those who are saved, because they were not saved. So that's one question that comes up. Number two question, well, what does this do about free will? Does this discount the whole idea of free will? You know, we read these verses, and it seems like it wouldn't matter what choices Esau made in life at all, because you know, he was predestined to be hated by God, predestined to serve the younger brother. And of course, that's what happened. In fact, when we look ahead at the rest of chapter 9 of Romans, it would look like, oh, this is just, a, a, just an apologetic. It's, a, it's an explanation for the strictest form of, of Calvinism, where God eternally predestines some to heaven, and he eternally, you know, from ages past, predestines and damns others to hell. Is that really what's in view here in Romans chapter 9? Is, is free will of man just a, an illusion? We're all just you know, puppets in the hands of God? Well, let's look into this a little bit. I think this is an area where we need to get a little comfortable being a bit uncomfortable. And in the sides that get set up on this debate, each one can give their responses with a lot of scriptures for support. But we still need to come to grips with some difficult truths. We need to accept some of these things as written without watering it down. For instance, for those of us who want to uphold man's free will choice in receiving God's salvation, we do have to deal with the fact that God has a choice, and he made it here. He chose to hate Esau. That is the plain statement of Romans 9.13. God has every right to do it because he is God. At the same time, for those who want to deny the free will choice of man and responding to the gift of God, they have to deal with the plain statement of Jesus elsewhere in the Bible, right? We think of the obvious example in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, they're on the other side, they would say, well, you know, you just redefine whoever as, you know, the elect, but it doesn't do any good to redefine the word whoever. Whoever believes... It doesn't mean that whoever is among the elect believes, because according to that theology, the elect believes by definition. 
the plain statement of Jesus leaves the whoever as an open invitation, something that cannot be easily denied. Okay, so there you've got the two extremes of the argument. Where does that leave the rest of us? Well, it means that in sections of Scripture which sound biased towards God's sovereign choice and predestination or election, we're going to need to uphold God's choice in election. And it also means that in sections of Scripture which sound biased towards man's free will offer of God's salvation, you know, we're going to uphold man's free will to God's offer of salvation. And if that means there are some Scriptures that we teach and we sound kind of like a Calvinist, yet we turn around we teach some Scriptures elsewhere and we sound kind of like an Arminian, well, so be it, because we just want to believe the Scripture for what it says, not for what our theological bias wants it to say. And it means that we need to be comfortable not necessarily reconciling every single theological truth in our own minds according to our own satisfaction. Now, these things can be reconciled. How do we know? Because God is able to reconcile these things. He's got both extremes written in his Bible. He has zero problem reconciling them in his own mind. And so we ought to trust God's own judgment in the matter. Now, we'll have more to say to this as we get to uh, next week in the next part of the chapter because it goes into great detail, God's sovereign choice. So keep that in mind for later. But as for this passage, Paul makes it clear that the salvation of God is offered through God's own gracious choice. God chooses to extend it to people through Jesus, and his choice is the only way anyone can receive it. Jacob hadn't done anything to earn the gift. God's choice to give it to him was made before Jacob had done anything at all. And that is the point. The point is salvation is a gift. And a gift has to be chosen by the giver to give. Think of a child at Christmas time. That child, and especially if you're like some children, I know you put together a long list. I know I did that as a kid. Just go through the catalog and I list out every single thing that's in there. This is what I want as my Christmas gift. Child puts together a long list of wants, but it's the parent who chooses what to buy and what to give. When Christmas Day arrives, the only choice that's available to the kid is to open up what's already been given. God gives a gift, and he gives it in Jesus. Our choice is to open it. You know, Paul continues his letter to the Romans here, and he's starting to get into some deep waters. You know, when it comes to the promise of the gospel through the Jewish Messiah, what about the Jews? Yeah, but what about them? Why didn't they receive the Messiah? The promise is wonderful, but what about the people to who it was originally promised? And the answer comes in two ways. Number one, the promise was unused by the Jews. God's salvation through Jesus is fully available, but the Jews did not avail themselves. And second is that the promise is a gift of grace from God. By no means have the Jews earned automatic salvation. If God chose to offer it, it was a gracious gift that he offered to a particular people. Grace is available. Grace is a gift. Thereby, grace is not to be refused. Don't refuse a gift. Don't take for granted what God so graciously and freely makes available. See Jesus for who he is. He is a gift of God. He's God himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He's the substitute offered for us. So receive the gift available to you. Cast yourself upon Jesus for salvation, ensuring that you are not Christian in name only, but truly in Christ. And I need to ask if that's what you've done. And if you have, well, give thanks to God. Give thanks to God for the gift you received and take advantage of every opportunity he gives you to share that gift with others. Speak of your faith on social media, Talk of Jesus with your loved ones on the phone, write of them in emails and those old-fashioned things called letters and cards. We can share our faith in many ways. What may appear to be a limiting time right now is a time that we can get creative with our testimonies. Now, the, probably more than it's been in a long, long time, our friends and our neighbors are looking for the hope that Jesus provides, so we want to be proactive in sharing Jesus with them. But if you've not received the gift of Jesus, today you can. God makes his gift available to you right now in this moment. You've got the opportunity to respond. You may not be in a church building. You may. It doesn't need to be anywhere. God hears prayer everywhere for those who seek him in faith through Jesus Christ. And you can do that and respond to God right now as we pray. Our Father, we thank you for giving Jesus for us. We thank you for the precious gift that he is. And I would pray that all of us who are listening right now have responded 
to that gift. Thank you for choosing to offer Jesus to us that we might be saved. You loved us in such a way. And Lord, there are others right now, perhaps who have not yet responded, and they've got the opportunity. Jesus is fully available to them. Jesus has already done the work for them. All they need to do is choose to respond and receive that gift. Help them do so now. Help them turn away from their sins. Believe upon Jesus in faith as the one who died for them at the cross, the one who rose from the grave, the one who sits at God's right hand. Help them surrender themselves to Jesus as their Lord. Change them from the inside out. Make them the person you want them to be. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.